On today's episode of The Nikhil Hogan Show, I am delighted to talk to acclaimed organist, improviser, and pedagogue, Dr. Pamela reuter Feenstra. We talk about Johann Sebastian Bach, classical improvisation, figured bass, improvising fugues, Italian partimento, the great organists in history, her two-volume series, Bach and the Art of Improvisation, her acclaimed organ and harpsichord recordings, and much, much more. Stay tuned. You're listening to The Nikhil Hogan Show. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the show. I am so excited to talk about my next guest. Uh, we have Dr. Pamela Reuter Feenstra. She is an accomplished and acclaimed organist and historic keyboardist, liturgical musician, composer, pedagogue, improviser, and conductor. She holds degrees in organ performance and pedagogy, choral music education, and emphasis in music theory, sacred music, and conducting at Dort College, where she did her undergraduate work, and the University of Iowa, where she did her master's and doctoral work. From 1996 to 2002, she served as a senior researcher at the Gothenburg Organ Arts Center in Sweden, as professor of music at Bethany College, Lindsberg, Kansas, and Eastern Michigan University. She's taught organ, harpsichord theory, improvisation, sacred music, and directed the Collegium Musicum. A founding member of Voci dell'Anima, she conducts and collaborates choral and chamber ensembles. She's one of a select, prestigious group of Florida Sun's classics artists, where her Bach, teacher, Bohm, and improvisation, and Froberger on the 1658 Dezentis harpsichord music is available. Her Bach and Improvisation and Tunder organ works are available on the Loft Gothic label. She has launched many creative works such as liturgical and improvisation events, books such as the acclaimed Bach and the Art of Improvisation Volume 1 and 2, the Muse series, Muse in Peace, Muse at School, Muse for the Soul, Muse at Work, and Improvisation Endeavors. Dr. Pamela, I'm so glad to talk to you today. It's wonderful to be on your show. Thank you, Nick. Your book, Bach and the Art of Improvisation, it is truly a wonderful work of research and thoughtful cataloging of the history and the methodology. Perhaps let's start with Bach. And I was watching a few of your interviews, and I was very much taken by the fact that Bach was an improviser. First of all, a lot of people play his works, but Many people, many people see him as a composer, first of all, but uh, he was quite the virtuoso, is that right? Yes, Nick, I wonder often how many of Bach's greatest works were actually dissipated into the air because they were improvised instead of composed. Um, it was during his time when uh, an organist would audition for a church music position or a teaching position, they would be required to have about 90% of the audition as improvisation. And then just 10% of it was wow. reading. Yes, isn't that something? And then the other 10% was reading continuo line um, in order to improvise above it with another soloist, a wow. violinist or artist. And so they, that art was so powerful. In fact, there are many scholars today who are beginning to think that the works that Bach and some of his predecessors, such as Böhm and Buxtehude, many of the works that they composed, they actually didn't compose to perform, but as pedagogical works for the students they were teaching how to improvise and how to compose. So they were just documents at that time that were used pedagogically rather than performance that rather than having this idea that these would be performance legacies for them that people would play centuries on. In your research, what is what's the cutting edge on Bach research when it comes to his methodology and his style? And what do we know now that's different from 20, 30 years ago? Um, related to improvisation, I haven't seen a, a lot from anybody um, writing on that because, of course, we don't have the same kind of documentation that we do with the compositions. But Bach also didn't write treatises. Uh, he copied part of one treatise for Anna Magdalena, his wife, um, to teach her some music theory concepts and the basics of how to read thorough bass. Um, but uh, so I started thinking, but it, Bach's music is timeless. It's ageless. People play it on every possible instrument and 
everyone knows Bach's name. I mean, he's his works are are works that um, every musician is challenged to learn, but that the, no one gets tired of because they are of such a high quality. Yeah, I, I really kept this question, well, how did he do that? And what about his music sets him apart in that way? And um, so I started investigating how he composed and how he taught, because we have some uh, letters and archival material about how he went about teaching different students. And it wasn't just one path. He met the student where they were at. Uh, oh, that's wonderful. And, and then also there, uh, Robert Marshall is one author who uh, started investigating how Bach composed and whether he composed in layers. And it, he discovered that um, Bach must have had a lot of this music in his head um, before he would start composing, but that if, if there's any indication of how he composed, he would compose a soprano and a bass first and then fill in the inner voices. Or when he was writing an imitative piece, such as a fugue, he would write the fugue subject and play that subject out as subject and answer in all of the other voices before then continuing with the counter subjects or the harmony um, that the third or fourth voice would add to a, a fugue. So we have a few clues. That's one thing that I think not many people consider when they're learning music, how the composer thought, because we have so much of their music in front of us on, on beautifully engraved pieces of paper, but and we learn them by rote, we memorize them. But I've always wondered, are we really teaching our kids or our music students in, in conservatories and other places, how they came to those notes. And they is it fair to say that the 18th and 17th century musician had quite a different skill set that was required back then compared to today? Oh, yes. Uh, they had to be very well versed in theory and composition as it connects to their performance. So it, I, I think often today... The theory courses are pigeonholed as, as one track, music history courses as another track, performance as another track. And it's too rare that, the, that these topics intersect. But the, the point of intersection that is the most viable and creates the most vibrant outcome is improvisation. Yeah, that's true, because you to improvise, you need knowledge of the form, you need knowledge of harmony, you need knowledge of melodic construction. Oh, there's so much knowledge that is required before you can even improvise well, I would say. Is that correct to say? Yes, and I, I told my improvisation classes for years that even if you are not aspiring to become a performing improviser, that one would aspire to perform solo improvisations in the midst of repertoire recitals. Even if that's not your goal, you will become a much better repertoire player if you learn to improvise. Because suddenly, rather than just taking a visual, tactile, and aural approach to the music, you're it, one begins looking at the music and listening to it and feeling it in the hands um, as if how was this invented and what other options would have Bach had or another composer had at this moment and how how was this option deemed the, the best option and how is that different than how he treats some of the same material later in the piece and it's asking all of these questions having a very curious mind and wanting to solve the puzzle of how did this come to be I mean it's sort of an archaeology a musical archaeology of sorts I guess uh, you said something about Bach uh, working with the soprano and the bass lines initially before filling in the rest, so to speak. Now, could you help me explain the difference between thorough bass and figured bass? Uh, yes, it's two terms meaning the same thing. Okay. And it just it refers to a bass line very often given to then a harpsichordist or organist, a, a keyboard player who would be playing with an ensemble. It could be a trio, as, as few as three members, or it could be a, a chamber orchestra, or it might even be an entire cantata choir with orchestra. Um, and 
Of course, parchment was at a premium and no photocopy machines existed. <laughs> no internet, <laughs> <And> so, yep. <laughs> exactly. So I think one of the reasons it, it um, became so widely used is that it, it requires very little space because then the continuum player um, plays the bass line, the same bass line that a cellist or gombist, or in some cases a, a double bassist would play, and, but then has figures just below or above the notes of the bass line, and those figures tell the keyboardists uh, which intervals are in the harmony above each note. Is the harmony absolutely fixed, or do, do you have options? Ah, uh, in terms of the intervals, you mean? If I'm a musician and I'm going to jam with Bach, so to speak, if he gave me a piece of music with thorough bass, is the harmony all set or is there room for a bit of flexibility? So as a thorough, most thorough bass lines are intended for ensemble. And in that sense, the harmony is, is pretty well set because if the keyboardist suddenly changes the harmony, um, what the keyboardist plays might clash with what let's say the flute or the violin. Is it fair to say it's kind of like a lead sheet? So it has the harmony there. And yes. if you have a knowledge of harmony, then you know what to play and what will fit and what won't fit. Yes, but what um, isn't set is exactly how that harmony plays out. So that the figures give vertical clues, but they don't give linear clues. And Bach wrote... He, he, no matter what kind of style he wrote in, he had this horizontal linear aspect of music, of voice leading at the forefront of his composition. So the harmony, he was steeped in harmony. His harmony is grand and very accurate, but also um, profound. But the, but it was never divorced from the linear aspect. And I think one great misconception about thorough bass is that it's just giving a vertical clue. And that's that's the beginning of the job of a keyboardist, but so much more is possible. So if I'm playing with a trio, I study the parts of the other instruments and find out where can I make beautiful lines that sound similar to the ones that Bach wrote for the other instruments without playing exactly what they're playing. Now, the study of thorough bass, I believe there was a book by Beethoven, maybe compiled by his students, on the study of thorough bass. And was this absolutely required that this is knowledge that is necessary to be an improviser? Yes, I feel like it's it's critical in in the work that I have done and in the as you mentioned it, extending into the 19th century it was still alive it certainly was alive in the 17th century as well and it, it I think it is the most succinct way of learning sound harmony in any given era and as I was mentioning before the the other aspect is listening to these other the other voices that are involved and um, I. I condense the, the linear part of improvisation with an ensemble to three Ds because this is easy to remember and it's a great way of summarizing what happens. And the first D is um, dialogue so that the harpsichord or the organ keyboardist will play in dialogue with the other parts. So sometimes one, one voice will have a motive and then a rest. And during that rest, the organ or harpsichord a uh, player could play something in imitation with that. That's what the dialogue is, is imitation. The second D is duet. And so this applies frequently to uh, stepwise motion in the other lines. When there's uh, a, a passage of stepwise motion, it's quite often possible in the keyboard part to play in parallel sixths or thirds with that voice. It sounds lovely and... Um, it is so much more interesting than hearing just vertical chords beneath that wonderful singing line. And then the third aspect is debate. And this is um, a contrasting part. So for instance, if the soloist or one of the members of the trio has, has a very active voice, then the keyboardist would uh, be better off playing uh, slower note values. 
And then the opposite is true when the soloist has long held notes. Then the keyboardist may add more activity in in the line that he or she is uh, improvising. And I give examples of this in my second volume of Bach and the Art of Improvisation because Bach himself shows us what to do in his uh, sonatas for violin and uh, obligato keyboard uh, because he writes out the harpsichord parts for this and he's doing exactly that, the three Ds, duet, dialogue, and debate. It sounds, by the way, it sounds like you'd be a fantastic teacher. I wish I had you as a kid to teach me. That would be fantastic. <laughs> Trust me, my music teachers didn't help me with any of this. <laughs> I kind of had to figure it out. But if I, let's take a, a thought experiment here. Let's say I was a student in Germany and I went to Bach. I didn't know anything. And let's say Bach took me as a pupil. What would he teach me over the course of a year? What would he make me do? Right. So we have documents of, of exactly um, what the answers to your question, but in each case it might be slightly different. So if you already came with a sound knowledge of harmony and thorough bass, he would have you start improvising trios and fugues, perhaps, or rather that would be the most advanced level for a student. So that would be the, the ultimate goal. If a student came with no harmony background, he he would have that student practice fingering exercises for sometimes months. And what uh, do we have the, the fingering exercises that he used? Uh, we have a few of his pieces fingered, again, in the Notebook for Anna Magdalena, and then uh, more, more particularly in, in the Klavierbüchlein of Wilhelm Friedemann, um, which he wrote for his eldest son. And he fingered several pieces there, and his fingering demonstrates different fingering technique. And then we have uh, C.P.E. Bach, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, his another son who became a famous musician, wrote a treatise um, about the true art of playing keyboard instruments. And in Mm. that is included... um, a swath of papers. They were kind of considered as tables and inserted, um, not right in the in the rest of the typeset portion of the book, but it's a page after page of fingerings for scales and various figuration passages. And the interesting thing that about C.P.E. Bach is that for any given scale, for instance, the C major scale, he has at least three alternative fingerings or that scale. So it wasn't standardized to the extent that we find in the late 19th, early 20th and century and beyond. Did Bach ever use the thumb on the uh, on the black keys like Chopin? Uh, we don't have any examples of that. <laughs> okay, that would be curious to know that. <laughs> also, his normal touch wasn't totally legato. It was considered a singing cantabile touch, but more from the sense of uh, C.P.E. Bach uh, describes it as a string of pearls. And if you study a real string of pearls, each single pearl is of a different shape. And um, each one, it, which is, he's talking about how, how you open up the sound of each individual note when you're playing. But each, uh, on the best made pearl necklaces. The jeweler will sew a knot in between or tie a knot between each pearl so that if the strand should ever break, then um, the owner of the the strand of pearls would not lose all of the pearls. They wouldn't all come on each floor. It would just be one pearl that would fall off. And that that image tells us about the kind of articulation that was normal for Bach in that um, there was each note was expected to bloom and to sing, but between each note there was also a tiny little space. And that space is the, the equivalent of what bowing would sound like on Baroque string instruments or tonguing on Baroque wind instruments or consonants in a well um, articulated, enunciated diction for choral singers. You mentioned fugues as perhaps the ultimate uh, aim for advanced students, and you mentioned an- another thing other, apart from fugues as well. What was what was the other thing that was? 
uh, for advanced students? Uh, yes. Yeah. So after the fingering and the harmony, then he often went um, with students to the two-part inventions. There are several several copies of the two-part inventions in, in pupils' hands, in their handwriting. Um, and that shows how frequently Bach was teaching this and having his students copy it to take it home to practice. And so that's teaching um, both the um, clean and clear voice leading within the individual parts, but then also imitation and how one sets one voice against another. So just bachiniums. And then after that, he would have them look at the three-part symphonia. And so in a way, it, it's a type of con contrapuntal advance from two parts to three parts to four parts in the fugues. When we look at the well-tempered clavier, which is perhaps one of the most famous pedagogical texts there are, since you yourself are quite a wonderful improviser, what's the right way to approach a text like that from a creative standpoint? Because you probably, as a musician, look at harmony, you look at texture, you look at motion, movement, whereas perhaps a student might just play the notes and not really think twice about it. How would you take something like that, which is very beautiful and, and wonderful, and how would you extract musical content from that that would Im improve you as a creative improvising musician? Mm. Oh, great question. So I, what I love to do with the Well-Tempered Clavier is take, first of all, the preludes and study um, one prelude at a time. And so play the the initial C major prelude, and then um, break it down. Oh, I should be by a keyboard so I could play it for your listeners. So if, if that first prelude has actually five chord tones, it's five note um, chords that are repeated, but they're all arpeggiated. And when Bach copied this piece for Wilhelm Friedemann, he started the pattern da 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 historic improvisation. And then um, what Bach did after several measures is that he started just writing the five note chord because he was running out of parchment. He had a small amount of space and that would take less room, but the, the schooled improviser would know then just to continue this five note arpeggiated pattern, even though it, was, it wasn't written out as the arpeggiated version that he started with. And I think that's a clue for an improviser that we can take this, then we can turn it back into the five note chords, transpose it to other keys. And then what I love to do is to take chorale melodies, because this was, um, chorale melodies were certainly one of the great resources that Bach drew from in his own compositions in every cantata has a chorale melody involved at least one and so many of his organ works are based on chorale melodies take a chorale melody and a chorale bass that Bach himself wrote but then uh, use this prelude material the design of the prelude um, with the, that new soprano and bass and so it's taking all of Bach's material, but in a way it's decoding it and then recycling it into a fresh new improvisation that has um, very firm grounding in how Bach learned how to improvise because it's taking all of his steps as well as some of his material. And it, it has astonishingly beautiful um, outcomes and this is possible with so many of his well-tempered clavier preludes. Okay, now you mentioned the preludes. Now, what about the fugues? The fugues, yes. Yeah. So uh, the order in which the the fugues and the preludes, for that matter, appear, of course, are, are by chromatic intervals. So C major, C minor, C sharp major, C sharp minor, and so on. Um, but they are not at all by in order of pedagogical difficulty. So I would begin with uh, fugues that are three voice and 
and dissect them again, decode what's happening in each voice. How does Bach write his subject? And then how does he write the counter subject? And then um, which um, modes or keys, mode, sh- I, I, like, I prefer to call it mode shift, occur within the fugue, which other areas, key areas does he visit and why? Why do those work and why do other ones not work as well? To get an idea of the form. Um, and, but what I do, I, I mean, looking at one fugue, it tells you about one fugue, and then it, then I would look at umpteen three-part fugues and then start with four-part fugues and five-part fugues. I, I also have made a comparative analysis of all of Bach's fugue subjects. And with the, the subjects, I've been able to determine that he, he repeats certain ideas. He has a... a just about a dozen different ideas that he uses in in different and they're wearing different clothing each time i mean he changes the meter or he changes the note values but there's the ascending tetrachord and the descending tetrachord just four notes in stepwise motion that work beautifully for beginning fugue improvisations it actually terrifies students in who are taking beginning harmony and counterpoint they can't wrap their head around the idea of even improvising a fugue but it's possible right it's very it's doable it is doable and, is, and particularly with a subject um, that is the stepwise motion because immediately it's possible to have um, a strato. So strato is a hurried or a rushed entrance, then overlapping entrance that where the, another subject will come in before the first subject is complete. So we have, if we just have one, two, three, four, just four notes of a tetrachord, then the um, normally in the first in, uh, entrance well, is Hold on a second. Sub- What's a tetrachord? Is that a tertial kind of chord? Tetra is four, so it means four notes okay. um, that are in stepwise motion. I see. And uh, and if we have these four notes, then it's possible um, in a major scale that one, two, three, four, we'll have the same intervals as a five, six, seven, eight. So the, the uh, imitation comes in with the exact same in- intervals. Uh, when you, when one starts first on the tonic and then answers in the in the dominant, so that solves a lot of problems for a fugue improviser because they don't have to worry about creating a real or tonal answer because the intervals already match. And I think that's a wonderful starting point uh, for fugue. I think most people when they say, "Oh wow, three voice, four voice, six voice," what does that really mean? Right. For Bach, it meant how many voices enter, first of all, with the subject. And it's typically going to be tonic, dominant, tonic, dominant for a four-voice fugue. And then that again for six-voice fugue, which is extremely rare. Um, And he was very consistent in keeping, once he has four voices in a fugue, he will maintain all four voices. Handel, on the other hand, um, a lot of people will know the Amen chorus from the uh, uh, from the Messiah um, mm-hmm. enters, which is a descending or it's ascending tetrachord plus. Right, there are four notes plus in the Amen chorus. So again, that same stepwise idea. But Handel will often set up each subject and answer in progression, and then um, certain voices will drop out while another voice picks up the subject, or the voices might start creating homophony, uh, more vertical chords above one of the subject notes, rather than continuing the, the imitation. And it still sounds very pleasing, of course, but it's not as- Intricate, would you be saying? Exactly, not as intricate and, um, as and disciplined in, in a way as what Bach insisted on in his own fugue writing. There's another intermediary step for um, people who would like to improvise fugues, and that is the partimento fugue. I talked to a Dr. Slominski. He talked about the Italian partimento. Is that related? 
It is. In fact, I think much of this originated in Italy. And Bach, of course, was very eager to study Italian scores. He first copied Italian scores to learn how to compose his own concerti, for instance. And this Partimento tradition traveled to Germany as well, because there were other Germans who used it, but it's particularly strong in Italy and and the whole Palestrina counterpoint then, um, I think, coalesced into other schools of Partimento counter, uh, uh, writing. And this is for in a few, in the case of a fugue, then a composer would write out the subject answer entrances again, what what might be considered the exordium or the beginning part of the fugue, and after that, simply have this thorough bass line that would, um, in some cases, the bass would carry the fugue subject again at a point, but the bass line harmony itself would tell the improviser where it would work to place that subject above the harmony in in other places throughout the rest of the fugue. Um, and they tend to be uh, rather brief fugues. They, they aren't all that often as lengthy as Bach's most mature fugues. But it's a, it's a wonderful way to have some material in front of, of oneself when, when learning to improvise a fugue. But without everything else written out, there's still this wonderful puzzle-solving aspect to it. What was Bach's stature as, well, you could tell me his stature as an improviser and a virtuoso, and also his stature as a composer. Do we have contemporary accounts of this? Yes, his, uh, there are uh, more accounts about his improvisation at the, during his lifetime, and that is people would be astonished, that word came up a lot in uh, the German texts, at his improvisations, and it's particularly related to how he would play continuo, because Bach would turn uh, a trio part, he'd be reading a score that would just have the thorough bass, and then there would be a cellist or gambist playing the left, what the keyboardist plays in the left hand, the bass line with him. And then he could read then the violin, two violins above it or um, two flutes. And then he would add to this trio um, a fourth voice. And they described it as as just baffling and and putting the listeners into this state of wonderment because he, in his right-hand part, would improvise a line that sounded as if it was originally composed with the other three lines. And this is one of the huge clues about this linear aspect of his improvisation, that it's, he certainly wasn't treating it simply as vertical chords. Um, Dr. Pam, how familiar are you with the um, the uh, not the the nineteenth century when it goes to Beethoven and Chopin and the or perhaps even the organ tradition? Because I know you've studied um, organ improvisation and and the history of historical keyboards. Uh, how did it change from Bach's time into the nineteenth century? I I think we just stepped over CPE <laughs> the the Gallant style, but I'm just wondering if we could briefly take a walk through history. Sure. Well, harmony itself, um, I, I consider Bach as being extremely pithy or concise in his use of harmony because his harmonic motion was relatively qu quick, meaning that he changed harmonies um, frequently, sometimes at every quarter note within a measure. What happened in the Romantic time is that harmony itself was um, slowed, the harmonic rhythm slowed down and the harmony frequently didn't change as many times per measure, but was stretched out more over time. The pieces became longer and then the harmony was, so that stretched out in a horizontal way, but it was also stretched out in a vertical way in that now more and more sevenths were added to the harmony, then ninths, eventually elevenths, 13 and then we're also getting into impressionism and not to mention jazz, right? <laughs> can you can you tell me about the great organ players in history? Bach is a, perhaps the most famous, but uh, who should some people, his contemporaries or perhaps people in the future, who are the great players of the organ? Who are the great improvising virtuosos that people should know? 
Yeah, Dietrich Buxtehude, uh, born in 1637, uh, who spent most of his career in Lübeck, Germany, was uh, a composer, uh, obviously uh, at least a generation earlier than Bach, but Bach traveled on foot to be able to learn from Buxtehude, and he stayed, he very much overstayed his, he got permission to leave the Arnstadt Church to go and, and study his art with Buxtehude, and he was get, granted permission for a brief visit, and he ended up staying for several months because he was learning so much from Buxtehude. And Buxtehude also, he even writes, he composes in quite an improvisatory way. And I think um, organists know about him, but I, I think a lot of non-organists aren't so aware of him because um, he wrote primarily um, choral music and uh, organ music that was played in the churches. Uh, he's a luminary. How is he different from Bach? If Bach studied from him, how is he different in style and in and, and substance? Well, one of the fascinating aspects of, of Buxtehude is that he wrote free works, preludium uh, primarily, um, but also uh, toccatas occasionally, um, that were based on ancient Greek principles of rhetoric, because we know that um, many musicians in um, Northern Europe were studying rhetoric along, they, I mean, they had to study Latin, they had to study rhetoric, and they would study music. Sometimes they would study law. These were more the... the um, Complete education. Absolutely. And that rhetoric play, uh, played a role in the form of the pieces. So there are six um, main parts to a, a classic Greek oration, and that was handed down into the rhetoric that was taught in Germany. And so Buxtehude often had these sections in his preludia, and they're, they're cl more clearly delineated sections. So he would have a free, catchy opening that would hook the, uh, the listener's ears. It might be a virtuosic passage work or some very dramatic rhythm at the beginning, and then alternate that with an imitative, a very studied, um, section and then back to a free improvisatory section. How was his harmony back then? Right, so he was dealing uh, more with the temperaments of pure third tuning, mean tone temperaments, and that on the organ uh, determined what harmonies were possible and which were not, and also even what keys were possible because the and the tuning had B flats and E flats. F sharp, G, C sharp, and G sharp, but the G sharp tuning was far different th from an A flat tuning, so A flats were avoided. It's a completely different world, <laughs> I feel. Three sharps and two flats were more typical in his time, and that affected what kind of harmony he would write and what kind of mode shifts he might make. Um, because the uh, organs themselves were so colorful with these temperaments, every single semitone in a chromatic passage had a different distance from each other. And so it's extremely colorful. And therefore, the, the ears and the, um, well, the instruments, in fact, didn't sound good if, if one would stray beyond that. But the ears were so enriched already with all of that color of the different spaces in the same interval that, it, you know, it didn't lack for anything. So his, his harmony was informed by the instrument, the technology of the time. Yes, yes. Now, moving forward to the future, past Bach, I would really love to know about the, the great organ improvisers that have succeeded uh, in, in history right. from that time. In the one of the high times in piano repertoire, you mentioned Chopin and Beethoven, but also Liszt and Brahms were great improvisers themselves. And at that point, the piano had overtaken the organ as, a, as the primary keyboard instrument. And because of its dynamic qualities and extended range, and it was, um, that's where a lot of the improvisation took place uh, in the generations after Bach. But then in the 19th century, a number of French composers um, emerged, Cesar Franck, for instance, 
and and then after him there there were um, Vienne and Vidor and Tournemur and then eventually Messiaen. Just really briefly, I, these names I do recognize. Maybe we could give a brief description of each one. So perhaps uh, Vidor. I, every, I think quite a few people know his his famous. Uh, Toccata. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. that's the one. The Toccata from Symphony Number no. Five. Well, and what's interesting about this, Nick, is that. This um, pedagogy that I've gleaned from the reports from Bach's pupils about his work works with any pattern language. So, and it, it works with jazz, it works with Messian. So, let's take the Vidor Toccata from Symphony Number no. Five. So, right. you might have heard it as a wedding recessional, for instance. And, um, it's a toccata, but it's still based on harmony. So it would be completely possible to treat that toccata the same way that I was describing with the Bach well-tempered preludes. Uh, yes, so it has this harmonic basis. We could reduce that to chords and study the harmony throughout. And of course, we've got added sevens, more um, ninths, more more um, divergent uh, key area in Western harmony. This uh, the knowledge of the figured bass is resilient enough to handle pretty much everything that it could that you could throw at it. Yes, so jazz symbols are similar. Uh, they're not written as figured bass, but we we have jazz lead sheets with the the chord um, the chords written above it. So you might have G minor seventh, or you might have A sus, or something like this. That's that's another code for how how to play the the from the basic music. How is it different? Because I want there sh there are clear differences. How, perhaps in an organ, in, when you see uh, the thorough bass, is there a, a horizontal difference uh, between just like jazz symbols? Because you, you get the you get the chords in jazz symbols, but uh, what are the differences? I guess thinking like an improviser. Right. I'm studying jazz for the first time this year and I'm totally loving it. I just heard Chick Corea with the Lincoln Center Jazz Ensemble Saturday two days ago. And I'm so inspired. So I'm really fascinated with this question. It's very similar to thorough bass because the jazz symbols indicate the vertical part, the harmony, but not the linear part. So you could take the same jazz line um, with the I mean, jazz uh, chord symbols and play it in so many different ways, depending if you want a lyrical setting or if you want to be dancing on the keyboard with arpeggiations up and down. That, that leads to my, to my next question, because uh, when a jazz musician looks at a lead sheet, he, can, or he or she can immediately think of this chord substitutions over a particular chord. Is that the same in figured bass? If, if you see some, a set that perhaps you've seen many, many times, can you tell yourself automatically, ah, I can do something different here. I can perhaps change the harmony. Yes. I mean, again, if you're not playing with a, a an ensemble where it would interrupt their harmony, but sure, there are chords that can be substituted out for each other. Some predominant chords, such as a, a supertonic chord or the two chord and the subdominant chord share a couple of notes in common and they can be substituted for each other. Um, post-dominant chords such as the sixth submediate chord or the, or the tonic chord, for instance, may substitute for one another. One is the more final so sounding, the tonic is, and the submediate would be more of a deceptive resolution to something that might lead to another area. And then, of course, secondary dominance may substitute I mean, if there's a chromatic alteration in uh, one of the scale degrees, if we're in C major and suddenly we have an F sharp, then that can become that sharp fourth scale degree might become a, le a new leading tone to G major. And so we have the subtle shifts. And so the, those shifts uh, with the chromatic alteration, that happens at a linear level the substitutions might happen more in the vertical level, the chord substitutions, that way of thinking. But I think it's always important to weave the cloth. So you've got, what do they call it, the warp and woof or whatever in, a, in weaving, mm -hmm. where you have both aspects and that's what makes it the cloth stronger, that it's woven horizontally and vertically. And that's what we have with harmony too.
I want to ask you about Klaus Bolt and a few of the improvisers of this uh, century, or oh, rather the last century, or maybe this century, who are doing stellar work in, and you yourself, of course, who are doing work, and who are the people we should be looking out for? Because there has been such a wonderful resurgence of classical improvisation. Who are the names that we should be keeping track of? Other than yourself, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Klaus Bolt uh, had a profound imp- influence on me. He's a, he was a Dutch improviser who um, played in Harlem on this magnificent, huge uh, um, St. Bavo Kerk organ, Müller organ, and he um, toured for a while. And I, I first I've heard him now on both sides of the Atlantic, but he. Um, took classical forms and harmonies, but then added fresh twists to this and uh, had such inspiring improvisation concerts. For him, very often they were based on Genevan Psalms because those those were the pieces sung most in the churches where he served. And, um, but he, and, and they're timeless pieces of music because they, they're Renaissance melodies and harmonies, but he would take the melodies. And they, a lot of Renaissance tunes have this sort of dance, almost jazzy element to them of syncopation, what we hear to modern ears of syncopation. And so he would take them and play them in all different styles, Renaissance, Baroque, and then Romantic. And, and then he'd add 20th century jokes in there. Um, unfortunately, he didn't live into the... 21st century. So yes, he's a, a wonderful improviser to listen to. Rudy Lutz, Rudolf Lutz in uh, Basel is a wonderful improviser and I've heard him be able to play in so many different styles as well. And um, Eduardo Bellotti from Italy, who's at the Eastman School of Music right now, improvises brilliantly in many styles and is also has that capacity for musical jokes, which I think is delightful. Uh, quotations. <laughs> and then Tom, Tom Trenny, who is uh, working near uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, again, mostly in a liturgical setting, but a very creative improviser. And he has also branched into uh, improvising film scores and is uh, highly creative with the film scores. I think that's quite an art to being able to work in a multidisciplinary way with sight and sound and uh, genre and era. I highly encourage everyone to pick up two copies for Bach and the Art of Improvisation, Volume 1 and Volume 2. What new things are in Volume 2? That uh, what, what are the differences between the two volumes? Ah, yes. In volume one, I'm dealing with the the fundamental techniques of thorough bass and harmony, and then chorales um, and bass lines, where Bach began his improvisation teaching, uh, adding the inner voices, and then um, creating variations, partitas on these chorales and bass lines, and then dance suites, which is essentially taking a a partita idea and changing up the meter and the character to fit with an Alamance, um, Courant, Sarbande, Minuet, and Gig. And that's a very brief summary of volume one. In volume two, I deal more with um, so-called free works, starting with uh, cadenzas and interludes, and that can be informative to um, soloists, non-keyboard soloists as well, who are asked to improvise cadenzas and concerti, for instance, um, and then traverse through uh, preludes and fantasias, and then um, the art of continual playing, and um, culminate with f- two chapters on fugue, first partiment of fugue, and then taking fugues beyond that first step of the exordium of the fugue into the full-fledged um, tripartite fugue. With a, it, it basically has a beginning and a mi- middle section and an end um, to the fugues that comes again from classical rhetoric of a have three three portions to a work of art. I'm going to buy it for my kids in the future. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> <Great. Thank you. laughs> I, uh, I I want you to also to talk a little bit about your uh, recordings, Bach's Teacher Bomb and Improvisation, and Froberger. 
Yes, yeah, so uh, I recorded the Froberger on this uh, uh, Roman instrument that was briefly in uh, the United States when I recorded on it and restored by Keith Hill. It was a Dezenti's harpsichord, a fascinating story that Keith thinks might have been uh, refitted for Queen Christina when she abdicated the throne from Sweden and moved to Rome. And she was a huge musical patron. She hired musicians from all over Europe and she moved to Rome and wanted to harpsichord immediately. And he suspects that she contacted Dezentis, who was the foremost harpsichord builder at that time, um, to have a harpsichord ready for her when she arrived. And he didn't have enough time to build a new harpsichord. So he reworked one of his harpsichords and then made, fitted it into a very decorative case that would be fit for a queen because the original case was more of a, a, a um, lower class case. It wasn't as decorative. So I got to play the works, um, some of the works of Froberger on that instrument. And it was so interesting because Froberger lived in Rome at the time that this instrument was made. And he was studying with the Italian Roman composer Frescobaldi and his works show a lot of Italian influence. So that was a wonderful confluence of, of, of styles and con uh, countries coming together and very improvisatory um, free works that Froberger has. So I, I was attracted to it for that reason as well. Did you, did you improvise on, on these albums? Not on the Froberger one. Um, I did transcribe some of Froberger's uh, pieces from a, a German tablature, which is a letter notation. As I said earlier, I love puzzles, and this is another <laughs> neat coding ways <laughs> of notating music. <laughs> um, but on the Berm one, I did. So um, it was within the past 10 to 15 years that it was discovered that Bach indeed studied with Georg Böhm in, in Lüneburg. And for a while, uh, Bach's sons perpetrated the myth that he had no teacher, that all of this was sort of divinely <laughs> inherent. You know, Fake news. <laughs> of of, of uh, amazement of, of their father and and to, so they could sell his, his works for more. <laughs> but then it was discovered that indeed he had some mentors and one of them was Georg Böhm. So I, in my quest to learn how Bach learned, I also wanted to study the works of Böhm. It's so cool that there are these awesome musicians that people don't know about, but they were really, really. And I'm, I'm looking at the Wikipedia for Froberger. He was super famous uh, in during his time. Yes, yes, yeah. He was well traveled and cosmopolitan in the influences that he forwarded in his music. So he's a fascinating character, and Verm in his own right was too, because he had some Italian influence in his works, some French influence, and of course some German influence and I think Bach absorbed a lot of that. So I took Berm's works, which are um, in general uh, a, a bit easier to access than Bach's in for improvising. And I played uh, on the CD, I play a work of Berm and then I improvise in that style oh, in cool. the half of the <laughs> CD on each of the same same types of pieces, but using different musical material. So I'm, I'm, I'm learning about his style by imitating it, but in a fresh new way. I'm not copying it exactly. I'm just learning from him. I'm reading here that even Beethoven knew Froberger's work. Yes. Are you familiar with uh, Johann Pachelbel's work beyond everybody knows his canon? I was wondering if you had any expertise about his uh, overall work. Oh, yes. Um, he uh, he had a number of students as well. And I, I use his uh, some of his keyboard toccatas and variation partitas um, in preparing to teach students how to improvise partitas as well as the toccatas, because he, he has quite textbook examples of this. There, he has fewer exceptions to the rules if you wanted to make rules about it. Um, and uh, so his pieces are quite easy to decode and to emulate. And um, 
So I can highly recommend that. And he obviously had a group of students too, because they together um, put together this collection called the Weimar Tabulatur. And his students are each taking turns at harmonizing chorales and then writing little fugal intrepids to the chorales as introductions to chorale singing. And the, the, that's a fascinating study for any aspiring improviser. Man, just imagine getting lessons from like one of these guys. <laughs> that would be pretty cool. <laughs> yes, and Bach, Bach was so desperate to learn about the works of Pachel Bell and some other people, contemporaries of Pachel Bell, that when he was little, he was orphaned at age nine and sent to move to live with his older brother. Wait, Bach, Bach was an orphan? Yes, yes. Wow. And he was sent to live with his older brother, Johann Christian, who was all, or Christoph, who was also a musician. But um, Bach was a bit more of a prodigy than his older brother. And he wanted to be copying the music of all these people, including Berm and Froberger and Pachel, all these people you're, all men you're mentioning. And um, his brother forbid him from doing that. And he took these scores that the little Bach wanted to copy and he locked them up in a cupboard and wouldn't give him the key. But this cabinet had lattice, a lattice work front. And so little Johann Sebastian's hands were small enough to, to work their way through the lattice work. And so he took the score of Pachel Bell and some other composers and he scrolled it up in his hand so that he could make it, it a small enough scroll to fit through the lattice work and pulled it out and then he hid it in his um, under his bed and then would pull it out and copy it um, on on full moon on moonlit nights because he needed the, the light of the moon so his brother wouldn't see him his candlelight. And he copied those scores. That's how desperate he was to learn this music. Oh, I wait a minute. Isn't this this was part of his biography, right? And didn't somebody take away that the, that painstakingly written stuff later? Yes, yes. <laughs> he finished copying these that pieces. Is awful. Under <laughs> great duress, and soon thereafter, his brother discovered it and oh, and reached it all. I just think, how did? <laughs> why would anyone want to discourage a child? And, you oh. know, now especially we know this is Bach. Who <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, Dr. Pamela, let me ask you one final question. Let's end on this. Where would you like to see the education system for classical music change from where it is now, knowing what you know and all the research that you've done and all the... Uh, all the education you've had and all the wonderful performances you've done, how would you like to see the typical classical music education change in the next 10, 20 years? Oh, what a wonderful question. I, I started working, Nick, with young children after having taught at the university level for years because I realized that these separate entities, all of whom were working with, with music, were not collaborating. They weren't weaving their information together. And, um, and with improvisation, I was trying to connect, let's teach improvisation in music history classes, let's teach improvisation in music theory classes. Students will m understand style much better, they'll understand form, they'll understand the application of the theory. And um, it's difficult, though, to change a, an embedded system. I, I learned that the hard way. And then I started thinking, let's start with children and have them learn improvisation and composition side by side with repertoire the way that composers used to learn. And, um, and in addition to that, let's get their whole bodies and whole minds involved. So let's do singing with movement and various other activities so that music essentially becomes embodied. And then um, the harmony and the melody and the rhythm, all of that is embodied. And then eventually with enough study and practice, it can come back out as the creative improvisations that are they are they're very good for the soul they're good for the the brain the brain activity that it takes to solve those problems it gets the right and left hemispheres working together it builds memory in in new ways other than rote memorization it's a much higher level of memory that's applying 
great concepts. And, um, and I would have them work on some of this outside in nature. So they're experiencing beauty and coming back to music as an art that is to soothe the soul and to calm the mind and the spirit as the, just the ancient as reasons for music and, and the earliest, you know, even music therapy, let's say, was to soothe troubled minds and, and bodies, um, to get back into a holistic approach to music it would be the ideal. And I would add, especially in our time, that I think it's really critical for children and adults to learn music of cultures other than our own to expand beyond the Western uh, canon and and start learning. Right now I'm taking, I'm taking jazz lessons and I'm taking Arab music lessons and I'm learning salsa. I'm trying to <laughs> learn music from around the world to appreciate the art forms and the intricacies of people from around the world so that we can come to a language where we can have a civil discourse and find peace and respect for every culture and every community and and approach this instead of with a spirit of suspicion that's all too prevalent today but with a spirit of wonderment of how did these people learn how did these people teach i mean just this process i've gone through with bach that should be the process you know i would invite people to take that same process with the people who are our neighbors um, right in our geographic location, but our global neighbors as well. What can we learn from cultures from around the world? And how can, I mean, we can learn a lot about people through their music, but also by listening to their voices. Dr. Ruida Feenstra, I absolutely applaud your work and your career, and you've done some tremendous things. It was such a treat to have you on the show. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise. I've really learned a lot, and I'm sure my audience has as well. I'm sure we'd also be absolutely delighted to have you back on again. I've been composing a lot lately, and we could have another whole conversation about that. And I'd love to learn more about your jazz work and um, intersections we might find among, uh, between our work. Dr. Pamela, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, Nick, for your wonderful vision for this show and for the, your kind invitation today. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to my interview with Dr. Pamela Roy de Feenstra. I've said it before, classical improvisation is a topic that's very important to me, and I feel privileged to be able to talk to such a great guest like Dr. Roy de Feenstra. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes. It'll go a long way to helping the show succeed and bring on more wonderful guests. Thank you again and hope to see you at the next show.